differential forms in cohomology. This is an approach to multivariable calculus that's independent of coordinates. If you need to review multivariable calculus, here are some nice notes. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? Leibniz differential, we know already, is not really a well-defined concept. It's very useful. f prime is df dx. We multiply up dx. We can do integrals. This is a good rule to remember how integrals transform under a change of coordinates, as in the Jacobian. But students get confused about these things. For example, in mechanics, we use this formula that relates acceleration, distance, and velocity. Does a depend on s or v or... It's not actually anything wrong with this, but it takes some explaining. Another example is thermodynamics. People write delta Q to emphasize that heat Q is not an exact differential. What does that mean? You can ask a question even in geometry. If you're on the circle and you specify this function, is it really true that df dx is 2x as you would naively conclude? This usually means keep y constant, but if you keep y constant on the circle, then also x is constant. There's one problem in more general contexts than we usually have in multiple calculus, more complicated spaces. So for example, a vector may no longer be definable by its angle and length as we usually do. A natural generalization is to replace a tangent vector by a derivative operator. Many of you have seen this, that you take some functions fi, you multiply them by derivatives ddx, and here I'm using the Einstein summation convention, so the repeated indices. So this is a sum where i goes from 1 to the dimension of the space. So if it's a three-dimensional, this would be three terms. This would be a three-vector, and it would transform by Jacobian matrix. By historical accent, this is called contravariant transformation. Contravariant because it transforms oppositely to this. Now the dual tangent vector, a dual space in linear algebra, is the transpose. So if you take the transpose of this column vector, you get a row vector. And it transforms by the inverse Jacobian matrix. So it's covariant if this is contravariant. This goes against this. If you know about metrics, you can raise and lower indices using the metric, and that's related to what's called the musical isomorphism in mathematics. But what does this really mean, this cotangent vector? In local coordinates, this is really what it is. It's just a bunch of functions times some dxi, some kind of new meaning for Leibniz's differential. It's called a differential form. It only looks like this, though, in local coordinates, and this concept is more general than this would have you believe. Here's a reason why this is non-trivial. Take the pressure P as a function of volume and temperature. Now, if you don't know about these things, then just take these generic functions P, and you go along some constant value of the temperature T. What does it mean to form the partial derivative keeping T constant? What well, means just look from this direction. You see this graph, and this is what the partial derivative means in multivariable calculus. But how do you go along this surface? If you go from here to here, you change both the temperature and the volume, then you can go, for example, first this path, and then this path, and start over with what first was the later path, and then do the first path. If the differential is exact, the order doesn't matter. In other words, there's a consistent height function. What that means is that since we had this surface here, it's kind of obvious geometrically that we will get to the same point no matter how we walk. We can make a topographical map, if you want, of an area. The test for exactness, for example, in physics books, is if you have something like this, you check if this is true, then you can actually write it as a differential. This notation doesn't really make any sense because it's not the height of anything. This makes sense if this is true. Otherwise, we shouldn't really use this notation. We should just keep this more general expression on the right. In thermodynamics, typical things that are not properties are work and heat. They're not properties like entropy, internal energy, temperature, and volume. And this was, of course, all due to Maxwell. Maxwell himself made a little plaster model of thermodynamic properties where you can actually draw them as a surface. So between differential forms, you have two kinds of products, exterior product wedge and interior product hook. And this is sort of an idea how you can go from contravariant, covariant to invariant. Let's try this. So the exterior product means just put these two next to each other and decide that this product is anti-symmetric. So if you flip them, you get a minus sign. And this is called a two-form. In general, this fij will be some bunch of functions. And this is a two-form, which means that this will be anti-symmetric. So the only non-zero part of this is anti-symmetric. Interior product takes a tangent vector, acts on it with a dual vector, and that gives you a number. And that's just corresponds in linear algebra to doing this multiplication that gives you a one by one matrix. What is a differential form from a general relativity point of view? In MTW, a famous book that has its own Wikipedia page, a differential form is viewed geometrically as an egg crate structure. So imagine in each direction in space, you have a bunch of planes like this. In other direction, you would also have a bunch of planes. And each time a vector pierces a surface, you hear a bong of bell. This is supposed to represent this kind of thing, that you get a number if you apply a differential form that we're trying to understand to a vector that we think we already understand. Those are, of course, the black arrows. It also gives the spirit of the times. In 1973, I guess people were thinking very creatively. Particle physicist, it's more somber. A p-form A is simply a completely anti-symmetric p-index tensor with indices omitted. Fine. 
doesn't give you any intuition, but at least you can work with it. And some nice rules are giving in Plotinsky's book, very concise, very effective. How do you differentiate these things? So the exterior derivative on a function is just the gradient. But you see now this really works with our intuition for the Leibniz differential and the Jacobian. This is very much like a directional derivative in calculus. On a one form, it gets a little non-trivial. By the way, in physics, we always put omega j here, but mathematicians like to emphasize that this is just some function in some coordinate system. And in general, omega cannot be written like this. Let's see later what that means. d omega, just go through this in detail, make sure you follow. This is just generalizing this exterior derivative to forms by applying the wedge like this. Now, you might say, if I apply this to a form, is this equal to zero? And can any form be written as d of some other form? And the answer is not always. This is a very nice page about this difference. The Poincaré lemma says, in fact, that in Rn, every closed form is exact. So then the difference is not very interesting. But already on the sphere, these things start getting more interesting. Here's another way to comb a sphere. In fact, you can define the wrong cohomology, which is quotient of closed with exact. We said that in Rn, this is kind of boring. But in general, in more interesting topological spaces, this could be interesting. Amazingly, this is relevant in physics. The so-called BRST method to quantize gauge theory and string theory started with the dewitt fada popov method. Read more about that here. This gives a powerful way to talk about standard concepts from calculus using, for example, the musical isomorphism. This is sharp note. This is flat note. If you're not familiar with this, just look it up in these books or in this page. Exercises to write these abstract things in terms of components, in terms of coordinates. We can prove an amazingly compact theorem, which is Stokes theorem, which captures all your favorite theorems from vector analysis. Sometimes people write it like this. The point here is mostly that you can switch this boundary operator, as it's called, with a D. You see the switching here. This is used in electromagnetism. For example, we can write the point particle coupling to electromagnetism like this, where this is the electromagnetic potential written as a one form. When people don't know about this, see this, they think, oh, you somebody forgot the DX. But no, what it means is this. These are the components of this one form in this basis. You can write nice things like this, relevant for anomalies, theta angle in the area of the strong nuclear force, and trying to solve that using things that could have cosmological interest, axions. And of course, you should look up the Aaron and Bohm effect if you're interested in electromagnetism and differential forms. The direct quantization says if there are magnetic monopoles, electric charge is quantized. This is a very interesting argument that uses the theory of p-forms. Same with d-brains and string theory. The charges of the objects upon which open strings end, they're called Dirichlet brains, are quantized. In this beautiful memoir, this is all described. Topological field theory is another example. It's a theory that does not depend on lengths and angles, like churn simons theory. This is the action of churn simons theory, and it's related to the thing I wrote before, like this. Here's a little footnote. Of course, Yang-Mills theory, very important. We can actually write form wedge form, despite the anti-symmetry, because if you make omega matrix, we put a whole bunch of one forms, and then specific one form doesn't always get wedged with itself. This makes sense for a matrix of one forms. These are very useful. They can connect fibers in fiber bundle by a connection one form, which is sort of the geometric way to think about Christoffel symbols. The curvature two form is defined like this. If you have a connection one form, and this is something that's discussed very nicely in Conlon's book, chapter 11. In physics, anomalies are very important, understood in mathematics in the 60s. We're still trying to get it in physics. This is also relevant for fluid mechanics. Usually it's impossible to solve a PD exactly. For example, this equation for shallow water waves, like these waves here form this amazing pattern. These are sinusoidal waves. Instead of sinusoidal waves, they use the CN function, which satisfies this nice trigonometric identity. And much more generally, you can do ideals of differential form to solve hard equations like this. A simple example is the heat equation. This operator should act on F. If you set G equal DF, define these differential forms. Setting these to zero gives you back the heat equation. This can be done very efficiently with some standard packages. These concepts are generalizations of these ideas here. So differential forms are useful for solving PDEs with a geometric perspective that doesn't rely too much on coordinates.